Okay, it's great to be here. My name is Tom Siebel. This is my fourth decade in the information technology business. And uh, I got started with a guy named Larry Ellis and then Bob Miner uh, in a company called Oracle Corporation. And as I was the 20 or 25th employee in the United States, and we grew that into a pretty big business. Second company was called Gain Technology. I was the CEO of that company. And uh, at Gain, we built the first system to build multi-user multi applications that incorporated sound, motion, video, graphics, text, and hypertext, something you do every, every day to day. But in 1991, we kind of invented that stuff. And uh, I later sold that company to Sybase for 10% of the outstanding shares of Sybase when Sybase was a real company. And then in 93, uh, we started this company called Siebel Systems. And Siebel Systems was about the application of sales uh, of information technology, communication technology, to the value chains associated with sales, marketing, and customer service. And as of 1993, that value chain was largely untouched by information technology. And so there was a big step function of technology that became available in the mid-90s, as some of you will recall. And, uh, that, that would include a small form factor, um, pneumatic computing devices, broadband with communications, high-speed relational database, broadband with, uh, 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 and uh, the internet, and importantly, graphical user interfaces with the introduction of Windows 95. And we basically took those technologies and pointed them at the value chain associated with sales marketing and customer service and build an integrated family of products. We delivered 400 products in 25 languages. By 2000, year 2000, we were doing $2 billion in revenue. We had 8,000 employees in 29 countries. And by 2002, we had 65% market share in every market segment we were in. So we were larger than the sum of all competitors. Now, that company merged with Oracle in 2006. and. Uh, after Larry had 3,000 people to compete with us for 10 years, didn't work out so well for him, uh, and for which he got less than 1% market share. But then when the companies combined, it turned out to be quite successful. So this effort uh, is kind of interesting. This, this, this is a more interesting problem. Let me see. Am I going to see slides here or not? Maybe nothing's happening. This is, has to be a hardware problem. Because all this boils down to that. Now, I'm seeing somebody else's presentation here. Let me see if we're ever going to get to mine. <laughs> no chance. Any help? Help. I, I do this without presentation if I ever was out slides if I have to. Okay. I'm pretty familiar with the drill here. <laughs> okay, let's look at interesting problems. Okay, so now this looked at an interesting problem. You know, as uh, of the time of the American Revolution, there had been 100,000, you know, there were, there had been humans, homo sapiens on the planet for 100,000 years. As of that point, you had a population of a billion people. Okay, today you have six and a half billion going to nine. And so really all the interesting problems kind of boil down to food, water, energy, health care. There are no other interesting problems. You know, I don't see, I mean, you know, posting selfies on the internet is not an interesting problem, okay? <laughs> We'll let somebody else do that, okay? So we kind of got interested in the, you know, interesting problem related to energy. And if you look at, if you look at the, you know, kind of interesting step function of technology that's come out of Silicon Valley and other places this decade, okay, it relates to the ability to handle massive data sets, cloud scale computing, analytics, machine learning, and social human computer interaction models. So we basically got together with a number of people. This actually originally began as a philanthropic effort. And then it turned out that, you know, and, and the objective was to make a, a contribution to the dialogue on energy because it's, it's, it's a, it's a dialogue that needed some contribution. And uh, so we're basically pointing that techno those technologies at this value chain, the value chain associated with power generation, transmission, distribution, metering and energy efficiency. Now this value chain worldwide, surprise, you know, no surprise to anyone through here is going through, you know, an upgrade, you know, to make these devices in this infrastructure, all these devices are being censored so that they're remotely machine addressable. And you know, this goes back, you know, from the vibration sensor on the nuclear reactor to the thermostat. The smart meter, the single phaser, the substation, 
the step up transformer, the step down transformer. They're all becoming remotely machine addressable and that creates some interesting opportunity. So what we did is we spent the last five years and about $150 million building a technology platform. So if we look at you know, underlining this value chain at the utility, we have all these siloed information systems that have been purchased and installed over the years from the General Electrics and the Siemens and the ITRONs and the Oracles and the SAPs, and they do things like generation management, outage management, meter data management, customer care and billing, CRM, you know, whatever it may be. And these systems, if you live in the enterprise application software world where I've spent my career, you know, you know that they don't talk to each other. And when they don't talk to each other, a lot of it is on, on purpose, okay? But the fact of the matter is to get to share data across these systems, for those of you who have tried it, is really difficult. <coughs> so we developed a technology foundation that allows a utility operator, a grid operator, to take the union of these data and aggregate them into a normalized federated cloud image. Okay, and we load these data into, these, into a federated cloud image at the rate of six and a half billion transactions an hour. I'm gonna talk about an example at uh, of a couple of, of case studies here. But some of these images can be pretty large. There's one image we're doing with a utility that I will remain unnamed, but it will be, this will be, you know, <coughs> on the order of you know, 30 internal systems, three trillion rows of data, 500 terabyte cloud image. Okay, now I don't know whether that's big data or not, but believe me, that's bigger than a bread box. So this will be, you know, one, one of the largest enterprise systems ever deployed. Okay, and then, so we, we, we aggregate the data from these systems into a normalized, normalized federated image, and then we built, think of it as a nuclear reactor level analytics engine that allows us to look at the data across all of the data in real time. Okay, this image is kept current in real time. So we look at all of the data across the entire value chain, you know, from, from, from the supply side to the demand side, voltage regulation, capacitance control, demand forecasting, uh, 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 distributed generation uh, capacity at any point in time, weather forecasting, and you know, analyze all these data every which way to Sunday using analytics and machine learning. And then we manifest the insights that we're able to extract from these data in a family of grid applications that entrust the entire value chain from generation analytics, renewable energy support, uh, capacitance and storage support, customer reliability and safety, grid investment planning, voltage bar optimization, outage analysis and prediction, asset system risk, uh, revenue protection, AMI operations, uh, distributed resource management, distributed res uh, demand response, customer segmentation and targeting, and then energy efficiency programs for residential, small to medium business and enterprise customers. All of these are discrete applications that basically lean on the same real-time cloud image. It is a very large, very complex application footprint. We've invested about, again, $150 million in this to date. I expect in the next decade, the investment in this, in this stack will be on the order of a billion dollars. Uh, now, what, what's the economic benefit associated with this? They, you know, we've done a lot of work with our customers. It turns out the economic benefit associated with this stack is on the order of $300 per meter per year in recurring economic benefit. And so you ask, you know, from where might this benefit accrue? Um, let's take revenue protection. Uh, in the case of you know, most U.S. utilities, a U.S. utility like Exelon, if you look at the if you look at the published data, you'll see that, you know, for Commonwealth Edison, their uh, non-technical loss, read energy theft, is about 1.5 percent of uh, the energy that they generate every year. Okay, that for, for Exelon is 100, that for Commonwealth Edison, that's $100 million. If through analytics, through looking at all the systems simultaneously, you can evaluate the signals, evaluate the usage, look at anomalous load patterns, you know, look at the, you know, which customers have solar panels that are generating energy at night. Okay, which, which, okay, wh okay <coughs> which meters are intermittently connected, running backwards, whatever it may be. If you can use analytics to identify half of the 
non-technical loss, and then through business processes, recover half of that, the economic benefit is $9.60 per meter per year. If you have 10 million meters, you know, this is significantly non-zero in the case of, say, an exelon. Um, predictive maintenance. If you can analyze the signals of all the assets, okay, in the grid infrastructure, okay, and identify signal patterns that predict a device that is going to fail, okay, and tell a, tell a grid operator at any point in time, you know, a, a, a ranking from top to bottom of the devices that are most likely to fail so that they can repair these on a scheduled truck roll rather than, you know, during an emergency situation. The economic benefit of that is $22 per meter per year. So this is where, so for a PG&E size utility, the economic value of this stack is, say, almost $2 billion a year. Now, these are the utilities where we're installing these systems a day, and these vary from, you know, residential energy efficiency programs, uh, demand response programs, AMI operations, revenue protection, system asset risk. So it's a very, this is a, you know, this is a very, very rapidly growing SaaS enterprise application software company. This is the economic value to Exelon and their customers of this stack. This is the, the estimates that we've done from McKinsey and Company and from working with Exelon. Looks like $2.7 billion per year in recurring economic benefit. Now, I've been in the information technology business almost as long as the information technology business has been around. And I've had the opportunity to be in some pretty interesting discussions with a lot of customers on some very large systems that we've deployed at Oracle and Siebel Systems and other places. I can tell you, I've never been in a meeting where we're talking about a billion, two billion, five billion, in some cases, five billion euros. Okay, so now you're getting into real money in, uh, <laughs> in recurring annual economic benefit. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, these are pretty interesting discussions. So what are these, you know, so let me, I'll just, just very quickly give you a feel for what these applications do. AMA operations, AMI advanced meter infrastructure operations. This manages the health of the AMI network. Okay, it tells you, you know, on a meter by meter basis, what signals are correct, what signals are not correct, what needs to be fixed, it correct signals in real time, and, uh, you know, predicts failure, um, and, you know, tells you on a location by location basis exactly what's going on in real time. Um, so revenue protection. This uses analytics and machine learning to identify who's stealing energy, how are they stealing it, okay, and how much are they stealing, okay? And, uh, and so that's the revenue protection application. And this, you know, this incorporates these billing data, okay, usage data, meter events, power analysis, and network analysis. To, to, you know, we, could, we do this today with about 30% false positives. Uh, I'm going to talk about an example of, of these two applications that we just deployed at uh, one of the Exelon companies called Baltimore Gas and Electric. So Baltimore Gas and Electric has two million meters, smart meters, and there we uh, integrated their data from their customer management system, their asset system, customer care billing, work order management system, meter data management system, um, outage management system, uh, and then UIQ right to the head end of the smart meters. And um, this, for those of you who have tried to integrate systems like this, this is no trivial project. Okay, this is, this is a project that we began, and the idea was to run, the, to aggregate these data, analyze these data, and manifest the insights in an AMI operations and revenue protection application. We began to work on the 28th of October, 2013. We went live on May 4th. 2014, full production deployment. This is 35 billion rows of data aggregated into a seven terabyte cloud image, okay? Uh, the economic, and the, this is kind of the mapping of the systems, you know, kind of that, we, that we had, the data that we had to aggregate. This is kind of by uh, lateral communications of data. This gets into more detail of the mapping. And uh, the economic benefit of this application to BG&E is, is $20 million per year. Um, this is how these applications were deployed across BG&E, Commonwealth Edison, and uh, PICO. And when we're done, there will be uh, 8 million meters and five applications. This is what the architecture looks like at BG&E. This is what it will look like at ComEd. 
This is what it will look like at peak dose. Uh, the economic benefit that they expect to accrue from these applications, these applications across those three operating units, is $400 million in recurring economic benefit a year. Um, so then, you know, in addition, at, at, at BG&E, uh, let's go backwards, you know, we're also deploying energy efficiency applications like for a small and medium business and for the enterprise. System asset risk, this is an application that puts a real-time risk index on every asset in the grid infrastructure. This is an order of millions of assets, right? Synco phasers, transformers, uh, 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 um, uh, thermostats, smart meters, and puts a real-time risk index that you know, looks at you know, manufacturer age, history, maintenance history, overload situations, uh, 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 load forecast, weather forecast, and tells you real time exactly what the health of your infrastructure is and identifies you know, what needs to be replaced, what's likely to fail. Um, good investment planning is kind of the reciprocal of that. If you're, say, Duke, where you're going to spend, I think, $12 billion in CapEx in the next three or four years, this allows you, if you, if you can you know, understand, you know, this allows you to invest, make your capital investments with surgical precision rather than a blunt instrument. Uh, and so this is the great investment planning application. Demand response analytics are obvious. Voltage optimization, okay, this balances, this basically balances voltage across the, the entire uh, in, uh, value chain and uh, if you do that properly, it reduces the amount of energy you have to generate to power the grid by 7%. So it's pretty significant. Customer reliability and safety. Outage analysis, prediction and restoration. C3 energy intelligence is a, um, uh, you know, kind of general use predictive analytics application. So that would be on the, on the demand side. Excuse me, excuse me, on the supply side, because it's, which is where the big market is. A much smaller market would be the, the, on the demand side. These are energy efficiency programs. We play, we play in a pretty big way. I think it's a small, it's a relatively small piece of the marketplace. I think maybe, you know, our, maybe 5% of the market opportunity is in residential, small and medium business and, and uh, um, enterprise energy efficiency. That being said, it's an interesting market and it, it fits in with our program and we compete very effectively there in you know, residential systems giving real-time pricing signals uh, to customers on the web, on the phone, through email, you know, whether, you know, alerts that they're overstanding the targets, see their bill in real time, and then communicate with them through 360 degrees surround sound communications. C3 commercial, I mean, this is, so residential is deployed at ComEd, residential is employed at uh, we'll be, we're getting ready to deploy at uh, SDG&E, uh, Entergy, uh, uh, NYSIG, uh, commercial, this is in use for half a million, half million customers now, small and medium business users at PG&E, it'll be used at, uh, at uh, we're deploying this at SDG&E. This basically is a small and medium business user real-time pricing signals and insight into what's going on, energy disaggregation, finds ways to save, what have you. Um, this is the same application that we do for the enterprise. This allows us to perform, an enterprise would be like Cisco, like Sutter Health, Kaiser Permanente, uh, Apple Computer, where we can go in and if we click on the upper left-hand corner, we can perform, you know, deep energy analytics on any facility, any Apple facility in, in you know, the pg and &E's territory, for example, uh, based on 85 KPIs. It allows them to benchmark their facilities against one another. It allows them to, in the lower left-hand corner, if they click on that, they go into energy, any facility to manage the energy plan. Uh, in the case of pg and &E, this would be pulling on 60 billion rows of data from 19 legacy systems in real time on somebody's laptop computer. So it's really quite remarkable. Customer segment tar segmentation and targeting is a product that we have. Each of these are separate products that we provide to the marketplace. Some companies will use one, some company, companies will use three, some companies intend to use all of them. Um, 
you know, this allows you to, you know, deliver the right message to the right customer at the right time through the right medium, you know, customer who's prepared to receive your message, okay? So we can, you know, we, we can segment, you know, our customers, you know, by whatever demographics or psychographics we might want to deliver, we might want to uh, think about to, again, deliver the right message to the right customer at the right time who's prepared to receive it, and we can get action. Uh, you know, the, the impact on energy efficiency is significant, the, the impact on en customer engagement is significant, and the impact upon customer satisfaction is significant. So we can get, again, whatever the media are, we can tailor it very precisely. So this is what we're doing. It's a very challenging project. These are very large data sets, very complex algorithms. Uh, where, you know, this it really turns into a machine learning problem. Uh, it's a, um, you know, we have a very, very rapidly growing business uh, in Asia, in Europe, and in North America. Um, uh, we're approaching it in a complete, in, in a very different way. Uh, I would say that, you know, whereas, you know, some people are looking at, you know, energy efficiency and they connect to the meter data management system. Or they look at revenue protection and they connect to the meter data management system. We're looking at all the data in real time. So think of this as the internet, you know, all the way into now in Europe, we're controlling the thermostat. Okay, so this looks as this is basically an internet of things problem as it relates to the energy equation. Uh, we do this in the cloud through Amazon Web Services. We also do it behind the firewall using a VCE implied. So it's um, of the various projects that I've had the opportunity to work on in my career, this is one of the most interesting, one of the most challenging, and uh, one of the most rewarding. So uh, if you know anybody who's like really smart and likes to work about 24 hours a day, okay, <laughs> and solve an interesting problem, and is committed to do whatever it takes to make, to do whatever it takes to make sure the customer succeeds, and even better is know something about data science, Tell them to send me an email. And uh, that's what we're up to. So it's, uh, I kind of hit you with a fire hose, but we're moving real hard, re real fast, and we're having a lot of fun. So there's a few minutes left, and if uh, Rick suggested that I leave that for questions, in case there are any questions, they're not certain what the technique is, you could just yeah, blurt it out. A few mics around if the you, room. If you do me a favor and identify yourself and where you come from, it'll, it'll help me out. <coughs> Thanks, Tom. Before we start the Q&A, we'll have a mic over there for that side. I'll, I'll be in the middle, and we've got one over there, so start right here. Hi, Peter Wallace, Wallace Energy. I'm curious, do you find the utilities purchasing your services on a sole source basis, or do you have to drive an RF RFP? How does it work? Yes. Uh, you know, it, it depends. There's a couple of uh, customers, uh, a couple of which I've mentioned who remain unnamed, have put us through the RFP processes from hell. And, uh, I, I, okay, and uh, but you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? And, uh, but in some cases, we will work with these customers and do proofs of concept where we're so far down the road that it's just a sole source proposition. So it's both. Good question. Yeah, Steve Hansen, Mortensen Construction. Um, Tom, taking a look at this information, you have large, large data sets, and you have a large opportunity for corruption in these data sets. Can you tell me how you can ensure protection of these data sets? Because it seems like if you get into the insides of what you're doing, you have the opportunity to disrupt a whole hell of a lot of operations real quick. Uh, actually, what we're doing, uh, first of all, there's a, it's a very good question. And at every one of these customers, whether it's Exelon or PG&E or, or uh, GDF Suez, okay, we have to go through very, very rigorous uh, security and penetration testing, okay, to make sure that it is secure. Uh, that being said, what we're doing, we're providing the analytics. We're, we do not have operational control of the grid. Okay, so, and so while we have very rigorous uh, you know, uh, techniques in place for cybersecurity and we protect the data and it has to date never been penetrated, but that being said, you know, knock on wood, there's nothing that isn't penetrable. Um, uh, but w we are not, we do not have operational control. And so that's where the, that's how it's isolated. Great question, Peter, thank you. All right, we got one back here. 
Hi, uh, Andrew Dillon from a company Varentech in San Jose, California, working on grid edge control power electronics. I was wondering if anything in your vast suite of tools actually impacts real-time voltage or reactive power along the grid, you know, the actual real-time uh, optimization of the grid. Uh, well, certainly a volt bar does in terms of managing capacitance. And, and that is very much real time, bringing capacitance on and offline to balance load. So that would be an example. Another would be, you know, in, in terms of demand response uh, or, or let's say load forecasting. Okay, when we're looking at both distributed generation and forecasted load based upon weather in terms of deciding up, you know, what sort of power generation capability needs to be spooled up in real time. So the answer is yes. One in the front over there. So far, your business model, oh sorry, Neetika Sate from Toronto uh, Power Stream. It's a local distribution company. Um, so far, your business model is pivotal around the utilities. Do you have any plans of um, actually going out into and, and, and uh, um, have a business model ac around the customer? You're doing demand response. You're, you, have, you have models there where you're you're reaching out to the customer. Are you? Do you have any plans of actually entering and becoming, um, you know, uh, interfacing with the customer? We do interface. First of all, great question. Thank you for asking. Now, as it relates to this whole area of customer engagement, okay, in terms of the application of information technology to the problems of customer engagement, sales, marketing, customer service, I kind of invented that space. Okay, honestly, I did. Okay, I, 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 and. So we're not entirely unfamiliar with it, and the answer is absolutely, okay? And so no, what we need to do now is we need to understand, I mean, there's no question, you know, what the computational device of the future is, and this is it, okay? And so we're doing a lot of work at, you know, I, I mean, it's not, the, it, it's not the web browser, it sure as hell isn't direct mail, okay? Okay, okay. and it, it, you know, it, my, I don't even know if we get mail at my house. Okay, 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 it's this. And so we really need to understand, and if you look at really what's been going on, you know, I think there's some, some important work that's been done in human computer interaction models, but they haven't made it into enterprise scale applications. And so we need to apply, you know, kind of the science of what's going on with social computing and apply it to this to really you know, entirely change the nature of the customer experience. So it's yes, and that is probably the biggest challenge today. Uh, uh, great question. All right, we've got one in the back there. Hi, great presentation. Uh, Arvinda Maitra from APRI. Um, you talked about some of the tools. You talked about the architecture of the utilities. How do you envision some of these tools, some of these algorithms, getting embedded into the planning and the operational tools that utilities are using. Because this is a major hurdle that we see right now. Some of the tools that utilities have, they do not lend itself to these real time, you know, time domain variations. So, so what's your thought of how these uh, tools get embedded into the utility planning and operational tools and, and be used? Well, you know, in my experience, you know, these utilities are not entirely asleep at the switch, okay? And, I mean, we're in very active dialogue with PG&E, with Exelon, with GDF Suez, with Enel, okay, in, in you know, five-year planning processes where they're figuring all this out. So, you know, those, those in the utility business who are kind of on, who are alert and at the top of the game are absolutely thinking about this. And so we're... we're they're doing it, we're engaged with them. It's a, it's a fascinating professional experience to be involved. All right, we've got one right here. Great presentation, uh, Antoine Pekin, Cilantro Semiconductors. We do uh, power conversion chipsets. Uh, I'm interested if you're looking at all into uh, the field of distributed uh, generation, such as um, uh, analytics on weather patterns, wind, insulation, uh, spot pricing of energy to aggregate that for the potential of virtual virtualizing power plants. Yes, and we have a whole distributed generation, uh, you know, analytics application. Uh, so yes, is the answer. We're we're all over that. One in the corner up here, is that right? Yeah. 
We'll take that one, and then this I've is got a, This is, a, I mean, what, what we're about is a very ambitious technology footprint, okay? This is, I mean, we are, you know, we are boiling the ocean, you know, as it relates to smart grid analytics. And, you know, but so far, you know, every one of our projects, we're involved in some very large projects, and to date, every one of these projects is on time, on budget, to spec, okay? And that isn't always the case in the enterprise application software business. Let me help you out. And, uh, Ms. Yeah. Hi, uh, Paul McCoy, formerly Hi, Paul. ComEd and Excellent, by the way. Hi. Uh, question. You're, are you with ComEd or Excellent? Uh, formerly ComEd uh. and Excellent, long time. Uh, with your presentation, it appears as though your your focus is on the upstream side, i.e. the utility, supply, transmission, distribution side. You only had one or two slides on the consumer side. Is that the focus? Is that your belief? Is that really the future is aimed at the upstream side down to the consumer versus the other way around? Is it, well, it's a great question, okay. But I, I think that 80% of the business opportunity is in the supply side. Okay, that being said, we're very active in the demand side. Okay, and I believe in the last four months, okay, if I'm not mistaken, virtually any, every residential and small and medium business, okay, uh, energy efficiency award that's been granted except one has been granted to us. So we are all over that. Okay, Hydro Quebec, SDG&E, uh, Northeast Utilities. I mean, we're all over that market. Our, our, our plan, is to establish and maintain a market leadership position. The way that software markets work, in my experience, okay, is that the leader tends to get 50% share, number two gets 15% share, number three gets kind of 10% share, and everybody else in the long run, in an expansive market like right now, you are right now, lots of companies can appear to be successful until the music stops. I don't know when the music's gonna stop, but it always does. Okay, and when the music stops, it's the base of the company that's the market leader in the space that can continue to generate cash. So right now it's a market share grab, and Paul, it's our intention to establish and maintain a market leadership position in the energy efficiency market. It's relatively small, it's relatively insignificant, but it's a real business and we want it. Hi, Galen Nelson uh, with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Uh, you're already tapping uh, a ton of data, obviously. I'm wondering if you could speculate about uh, emerging uh, potentially disruptive data sets that you see coming down the line that will impact your business. Well, just the ability to be, I mean, aggregate all this information, you know, when we're integrating, you know, social networks and Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds with, with customer care and billing and distributed generation and generation capacity and load forecasting. I mean, I don't know whether that's disruptive or not, but, but, but you can have a, make a very, very real contribution to the safety, the reliability, the efficiency, and the, and the, and the environmental impact of power generation and delivery. And so I don't know if it's disruptive, but I think it's, you know, it's a good thing. And, uh, and, and so that's what we're all about. Tom, I've got one final question for you. Um, when we had a chance to meet back in January, I met you and your team, you kind of went us through the product. I think clearly the, the things that you went through in your presentation, talking about the application for the customer is most important, but I think in building a company like this and differentiating it, there's probably a lot of very complex, IP under the hood. Can you talk or just comment a little bit on some of how you're achieving, you know, what you're doing? When we looked at the problem initially, okay, the original, for those of us, you know, the, the original problem, the, okay, <coughs> there are two problems that look daunting, three that look daunting. One was the ability to aggregate the disparate data sources. Okay, I've been at this, this is my fourth decade, okay, this is really, really hard to aggregate information from disparate energy, uh, I disparate enterprise information systems, okay? So one was the ability to aggregate it. Second was the ability to analyze it, okay? When you're looking at, you know, potentially a half a petabyte of data, okay, that's being incremented at the rate of maybe, you know, 200 gigabytes a day are flowing into it. To be able to keep up with that and analyze those data in real time is a daunting problem, okay? Once we got there and kind of nailed that, okay, and it took us a little while, okay, then you get, it's kind of, you get to the seventh level of a video game, and you, you're, you know, like a whole new world. Well, it turns out it's a, it becomes a machine learning problem, 
okay? And machine learning is this new science about self-learning algorithms, that every time they get fired, they, they fire, they get better at what they do. So we had to amass a very large collection of human capital around machine learning. Software business is a human capital game, okay? You know, hard stop. It's, you know, your team against their team. It's just like football. Uh, and, um, you know, I think in machine learning, we, we've developed a, a team that's second to none. I mean, there's a lot of our websites about machine learning. I guarantee you that everybody who competes with us, you know, within a month, you know, they, you know, they, you know, they followed us in the big data discussion, they followed us in the analytics discussion, and now, you know, next week they're going to talk about machine learning on their websites. But this is what we're spending really all our time. It's a machine learning problem, which is a fascinating field. Take a look at it on Wikipedia. And, uh, uh, but this, this is what it's all about. Okay, before we applaud Tom, just a quick note. Uh, we're going to take our first break. And again, C3 was kind enough to supply us with a great um, cafe out front. So enjoy the break. Enjoy um, the espresso. And thank you very much, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you.